we're back for more and I'm pleased to say this is the second session kindly sponsored by Bix. Bix are obviously our main sponsor of this event. Come on, a round of applause for Bix. We've actually made all of this possible, as well as, of course, our other sponsors who have been named and will continue to be named throughout the event. We'd like to introduce a Divya guy. We'll come back to the stage and Divya will set us up, will set, frame the discussion, yes. ensuing discussion with a short presentation. And thereupon, I will introduce our we other esteemed panel members. Here we go. No. Sorry. We just go to Fail. the conversation. Thank you very much. Great. Well, pleased to note we don't have a presentation here, which is absolutely wonderful. We're going straight to it. So let's introduce our speakers. Come on. David from Google. Fantastic. Warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to have Christina Costandace, who is the Chief Revenue Officer of Rakuten Viber. Thank you very much. I saw your hands. <laughs> Christina hurt her hands, but there we are. I've got to be very, very careful there. So Rakuten Viber are a MEF member, which is absolutely excellent. So the first chat out MEF member. And we've got Mauro Caravene from Calera. Uh, MEF board member, welcome. Well. Yes, now we can, now we can. Thank you very much. Sorry, Debbie, I forgot, of course. No presentation, it was just your first one. Shame on me. There we are, with the fail. Okay, so we're building really towards a crescendo towards the end, coming really towards the close of the event. We've still got the afternoon, obviously, to come. But in simple language, Divya, we'll start with you, because this is your, your panel at the end of the day. With CPAS, what, what outcomes, compared to just, say, simple one-channel offering, whether it be just SMS on its own or voice on its own or email, what outcomes can you have by employing a CPAS strategy compared to a simple single-channel strategy? What have you seen? Great question, uh, James. But first of all, I would like to thank the panel here. It's a great panel, I must say, right? You will have insights from experts in the industry and coming from different background right so thank you very much guys for for accepting our our uh, offer to join us on the panel uh indeed so i i talked about it yesterday right i mean uh, we talk about uh first of all the track the awareness phase then the enablement phase and then the engage phase one channel cannot take care of all these pillars of engagement right so you have to make sure that you offer your customers with different options and then let them select, right? The consumer is the one, the consumer is the king actually, right? In our business. And we have to always remember that. And we should give consumer the right to select their preferred channel. And based on their preferred channel of communications, we should provide them normal communication capabilities. And sometimes we should be able to escalate it forward to, you know, when I talk about the value in the customer journey to, to life support, for example. So you have to make sure that you give consumer the capability or select, allow them to select the channel in their own terms and allow them to let you know when they want to interact with the brand, right? And it is about, I think we talked yesterday with uh, Maro, it is about how they want to interact with you and when they want to interact with you, right? It should not be us who should be, you know, bombarding them, us as, I mean, the enterprises and the people like us, you know, who are, who are in the value chain, but it should be them telling us, okay, I want to interact with the brand for this purpose and this is how I want to do it. So it should be in the hands of the consumer and we have to give them. I like, capability. I, I like that frequency angle. It was talked about on a previous panel about the frequency of discussion. I think we all have examples where we've been bombarded with engagements from brands and it all becomes a bit too much. But then there's the other angle as well. Is it simply because the, the offering, the way we're being engaged with it isn't clear and it's being disjointed that we have so many different engagements? So really good point. Christina, bring you into the conversation because... Uh, with all the other chat apps that have come along in the whole world and everything like that, I think a lot of people have forgotten that you were actually the first chat app to have a business messaging solution. Can you, can you just talk us through how that came about and how, how easy or not it was to move from a free model into the business world with a chat app? Yeah, uh, it's true that um, we launched business messaging way before WhatsApp. Um, and in some some regards, it's actually a lot more developed than WhatsApp are um, offering. Um, 
frankly, the, coming back to the pricing conversation, um, introducing a business model for business messaging wasn't the, the difficult part. It was the easiest part because in our case, the way that uh, the original offering for business messaging works uh, was as an alternative to SMS, meaning that we reached out to the SMS aggregators, a lot of them here in the room, um, and in the markets where Viber is strong, and thank God there are still a lot of markets uh, for that, um, enterprises can choose to first uh, send a, a Viber message, and in case this Viber message is not delivered, then there is a fallback to SMS. Needless to say, however, the cost for the Viber message is um, a, a lot more competitive than the SMS, and we've heard a lot about the strategy for pricing around SMS, um, in addition to some other advantages like uh, charging on delivered rather, on, rather than send, allowing up to 1,000 characters rather than 160 for the, the very unsexy SMS, um, and down the line, introducing a lot of other features that are very much in line with what we call rich messaging, which would be uh, uh, from simple images to down to videos, allowing file transfers these days, um, allowing two-way communication. So really enhancing the way that the, the messaging is sent and is received by the user to allow one-to-one uh, -one communication um, way beyond the, the one-way SMS or the one-way messaging. So um, we've been doing that over time. Um, the adoption has increased. Um, the, a lot of the features, especially the interactive one, especially the 2A one, um, have obviously uh, increased as well. Uh, but that is not to say that, unfortunately, a large part of the messages still remain one way, which is down to uh, the fact that, you know, brands, enterprises choose to, or rather they decide the way that they structure their marketing strategy, um, not necessarily the most intelligent approach. Um, and this conversation goes back to uh, where brands are and why can't we have a conversation with them and education and explaining to them that, okay, um, you know, giving the customer uh, uh, the opportunity to engage with you is a lot more uh, relevant than spamming them with useless uh, marketing communication that they never asked for, or if they did, they completely forgot about it anyway. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mara, uh, Claire, you're from, you're from Calera as well. Uh, question regarding the element of moving beyond simply just SMS, which apps from your perspective, from the Calera perspective, do you see as bringing the biggest return on which apps or messaging channel, should I say, within Omnichal, do you see in the next one to two years, let's frame it in the next one to two, bringing the biggest return on investment. Because at the end of the day, there's of course, this is return investment for your business. You're putting me in a, diff a difficult spot. Yes, since I know. We have a... <laughs> this was the idea of this panel, bringing these, uh, <laughs> these people on. We're going to make it easy yeah. for everyone. And and where would the fun be in that? <laughs> so obviously, it's return investment for your business. But in terms of return investment, ultimately, again, we go back to the enterprises. They're bang for the buck their return on investment, what okay. channels do you see personally? Ignore who you've got sitting to your no, left no, okay, well, and I'm, in front of you. I will, I will be Speak able. openly. I will be able. Uh, no, first of all, uh, because here we talk about customer journey and for me it's super important to think that the customer journey is the, what is important for the enterprise. So let's start from this yes. point of view. And uh, being a user, I think that they have the right uh, to get the communication. I don't talk about message, just communication. When I want, how I want, and with the content that I want. So that's from my point of view, it's really what, what will be important in the future. So it's, uh, I was, uh, the, the number 140 billion SMS a day, A2P, it's scared because think about how many people live on the, on, on our, on the globe, it's 7 billion. So this means that every single person received today 20 SMS a day, and uh, including uh, kids uh, and uh, very old people. So from my point of view, I will not answer telling you it's WhatsApp, it's uh, whatever, doesn't matter. I will, not, I will not tell you this. But uh, from my point of view, the one that will be the most successful in ensuring that the quality of the message is relevant, the timing of the message is relevant, and uh, even the choosing the right channel, because you, you, you made the example this morning saying uh, uh, about, uh, I, I have exactly the same one. So I have two daughters, 12 and 16. I have my mom, which is 85. Uh, they, are, they have the same SIM card from Vodafone. Now, uh, if Vodafone want to communicate with them, uh, they need to use completely totally different channel. My mom, she use SMS, that's all. 
she doesn't have a library, she doesn't have anything else. So it's my daughter, they don't even know that SMS exists. They have their messaging platform on their Android phone, they never open, never. They just are all the time on WhatsApp. So for me, there is no one single answer. I can tell you that I'm expecting for us uh, big growth from RCS, uh, from WhatsApp, uh, and uh, I can say also from Viber, but uh, <laughs> the, the, those, those are clearly, we saw from Nick, the, 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 the channel that are growing more. But for me, we still need to see development uh, in all of them to help us uh, in ensuring that the communication is relevant for the users. So whoever will be able to make communication relevant for the users, filtering, uh, ensuring that there is quality, ensuring, and by the way, the quality this morning uh, when WhatsApp was pre pre presenting, she said, uh, we ban uh, enterprise that don't behave properly. That, but that system, in my opinion, is not scalable. It's, it cannot be that there is one entity that decide that ban someone, because if that needs to be, came, it's exactly what we see with Twitter now with Elon Musk. So, it, so answering to your question, I will not tell you which will be, but from my point of view, it will be the, the, the app chat that will be able really to ensure relevant content in the right moment uh, for the right uh, uh, audience. That's uh, David's. Talking about rich business messaging, RCS. So there's, and this is that I'm looking at the title of the thing. The, the, the customer journey starts from the moment where someone actually gets interested in the brand and actually gets onboarded, purchase something, the post-purchase experience. There are a lot of elements in there. And uh, we know those of us who've been looking at RBM, RBM is great for so many parts of that parts of the part of that customer journey. How do you go about avoiding friction when you're putting together a channel like RBM? Because at the end of the day, friction is a killer. And you may have the best channel going, which will give the best visual experience, experience, etc. But if you add one too many steps, or you make a misstep, and someone doesn't receive that authentication because of where they just happen to be roaming, people won't use it. They won't use it. So how do you go about avoiding that, uh, avoiding that friction? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, um, thinking about the customer experience, I'm particularly framing the way that Vivia framed yesterday, which is like awareness, enablement, and engagement. Mm -hmm. The way that we see this is about completing the jobs to be done. And obviously, I mean, there are jobs to be done that messaging in the way that we are performing ourselves uh, can really cover that part of that experience. And when you think about friction, I mean, once you start enabling a job that really fits into what the user is looking for or what the brand is willing to deliver, and I'm going to give you some examples. For example, you're looking for uh, information about a product, and then you go to Google search, and instead of going to the website and spend time looking for the product there, you just open a chatbot experience, you start talking to uh, a representative that is going to give you the information. That information is going to be more frictionless than probably the way that it is happening today. So another example is, for example, when you are already buying the product, no, are you using rich business messaging? And to a point where a brand, once you buy the product, they really send you information about what is going to be the experience you're going to have with that product. So they create like an onboarding experience and they drive loyalty, you know? So those are two examples of uh, jobs to be done experience. No? And we have seen already brands like, for example, Netflix, that they're using this type of experiences, you know, just to only just asking questions, sending you videos that are intimately integrating with their own uh, device. For example, one of the, th the things that RBM is doing is integrating this with uh, YouTube. So you can see and you can watch in real time some of those videos that makes the experience way more interactive, no? And with that experience, for example, Netflix can ask you, hey, are you an existing subscriber or are you uh, a non-subscriber? So they, based on the options that you have, they can provide you, for example, if you're an existing subscriber, the possibility to send you recommendations of the new content that is coming out, which is great for engagement, or if you are not sending you a promotion uh, in that front, for example. So that seamless integration which makes things easy for the customer so they don't have, this, have that experience. Yeah. Now, to be one, one, one point sorry, that I want to, yes, uh, I think that this is important because uh, at the end of the day, when we're talking about these type of platforms, we're talking about customer experience type of platforms. We're not talking about SMS anymore. So that requires a better chatbot integrations, better dialogue creation, better creative, and obviously a better backend integration with the system. So it requires more work for the brands, but at the end of the day, it will create that better experience that you're looking for. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Divya, 
within MEF, we have six ecosystems, six product areas in simple language. Uh, one of them is IoT, and IoT has not been mentioned during this event yet at all, which is actually surprising. But believe it or not, IoT has the potential to sit with, on, within omnichannel, does it not? And how can that improve ultimately the customer experience? Exactly. So um, at BIX, we, we have a vision of including IoT as part of the CPaaS ecosystem, actually. I was talking to Dario this morning that we consider that, you know, we are, we are in the space of, you know, P2A, A to P messaging, and now it goes to the devices, right? So there are connected devices, vehicles, and you know, we have to make sure that we all consider that as part of the ecosystem. And now individuals can not only talk to the application, but directly to the devices. There are smarter devices which have the, the you know, the sensors are there, the attenuators are there. So you can directly talk to the devices and this will enhance the customer experience, right? You are not only talking to the app anymore, and there are a lot of things are being done by the, by the device manufacturers and telcos, and re really we have to appreciate that, right? Because IoT is something that is coming along with the telcos taking this further, right? And there, if you look at how the motherboards are being evolving now, you know, there's the eSIM and now there's iSIM integrated SIMs are coming up, right? So IoT is becoming real. Exactly. Omnichannel has been around for 12 years, but it's been, yeah, yeah. it's been, yeah. it's been vaporware, so, but recently, the past two to three years, it's become it's really real with real. the offerings from so many companies in this room. And it will be integrated and embedded with the CPaaS channels going forward. If you will see that you are talking about smart homes already, but now you will have an interaction via CPaaS platforms with the devices going forward, right? So you can you can set your your temperature in the house, or you can even order a coffee frictionless, right? So this is part of the customer experience, and it's gonna come. And I'll I'll talk about what uh, David said, right? And and I think we we are going to touch base on the super app. So, I mean, if I may say, it, RBM is kind of bringing the super app functionality, right? I mean, kind of bringing together multiple things, uh, YouTube and Netflix, and you you know, you can access different sources of uh, media or, you know, delivery uh, wi or via this application. So it will become a kind of a super app in the future. To some extent, yes, it is, for example, just give you some example that we're uh, evaluating is the idea that when you are, um, checking in and you get the boarding pass, you can integrate the boarding pass, for example, with Google, Google Wallet. I mean, that is going to be a very seamless experience, for example, or things that the channel can do today, which is like integrating with Google Maps or integrating this with your calendar. So you can, it can be way more interactive, for example, when you are going to book a restaurant or you're going to look for the next store in that type of experience. It's convenience. It's, yeah. Yeah, and um, the more you evolve, this, the more opportunities you have to really create more things, like, for example, integrating payments or integrating uh, add to basket or catalogs, things like that. But at the end of the day, both consumers and brands are very actively looking for. Yeah. And I just read, um, I mean, it, I think you can go on the GoCheck site, right? It's a, it's a super app in Indonesia. I'm sure you know about it, James. And they call this super app. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So it's a super app uh, in Indonesia, right? Uh, it's uh, very famous. And they call the app as the portal to internet for the mobile first generation. So, you know, they have given a kind of, a, you know, a, a definition to the super app itself, which is, which if you, if you think about it, it's quite relevant, right? You do not have to go to internet anymore. You can do everything via the app itself. So that, that brings, so th that's a really, really good point. Because Mara, you're talking about your 85-year-old mum who just uses SMS. My mum is uh, my mum is 83. She's great with WhatsApp, actually, as well. I have to admit, sorry, <laughs> with her with her, uh, with her smartphone and uh, WhatsApp. But bringing these channels to a different audience because we seem to be locked in this mindset talking about huge brands, talking about younger people who are using TikTok and Instagram and this, that, and the other. But actually, at the end of the day. Who has got the money to spend in the majority, the, the major parts of the world with the major populations? It's not the youngest people. It's quite often the older people who've got that money. And how do we tap in? How do we make messaging? How do we make payments easier on the go and the convenience? So 
that, <clears throat> that's a thing it's all about uh, integration integration of the platform and uh, the example that david was mentioning about the boarding pass uh, this morning i did my check-in uh, i'm flying back to italy with uh, alitalia on oita which is not always a great experience and uh, so I, I, I was uh, just this morning, I was checking in and uh, they have this service over uh, WhatsApp uh, and they send a number and then they ask my uh, loyalty number. And then that was my first comment. I said, okay, if you know my mobile number, you know already who I am. Why do you ask me more information? And then they sent uh, the boarding pass over email. And then I had to, so it's, again, no, I don't want to, to say anything bad about it, but uh, I think that uh, the way of uh, involving all the users, and I'm not talking all of us that are in this industry since uh, ever, and uh, we, we use a device and so on, it's just to make things uh, simple for everybody. It's disjointed. It's that, just, it's that yeah. direction. That's yeah. killer. That, that, that's killing everybody. And uh, it's all about integration. I come, by the way, from an industry which is uh, um, IPaaS, so Integration Platform as a Service. So the last uh, four years, I was uh, running a company in the IPaaS. And it was all about uh, helping enterprise in integrated in creating common data model and so on. And from my point of view, we in the SIPA space, we need still to make a step up to, to reach the level of the IPAS. So where we, of course, meta announce partnership with Salesforce, so they are integrated. But once you look at how they are integrated, still it's super complex. And uh, the same is we expose API so everybody can connect to our own API and so on. But this is just uh, still one level of complexity that we need, we need to fix. And for an user point of view, all the information, all the data should come automatically. And then once it's easy to be used, uh, you will get my mom as well uh, using WhatsApp and doing the check-in. <laughs> and I'm sure she will, she will be on board. Yes. Uh, so, Christina, within Rackets and Robot, how do you go about Avoid, avoiding as far as possible this friction, this disjointedness between systems and solutions. Because we talked about this before coming on stage uh, earlier this morning when you arrived, and uh, talking about, again, it may come across, oh, here he goes again, but small and medium-sized businesses, they are the majority of the world. They have the majority of the revenues. They have the majority of employees, people, etc. How do we get them into this without having this disjointed experience where you end up with people saying, do you know what? I've been using email all the time. You're making life difficult. I can't be bothered. I'm just going to continue using email. I don't care what, uh, whether it's RBM or Rakuten uh, Viber or WhatsApp or SMS. Forget it. It's too difficult. How do you avoid that? You as a business within Rakuten Viber. Yeah, but we are a channel. So for us, it's slightly different how we approach this because um, to Mauro's, Mauro's point, we're actually building the experience for the, for the customer. Um, so we're offering them uh, uh, the opportunity to for, for a for a for a user to connect to their um, uh, Paul's Bakery or to Alitalia or to uh, I don't know what their utility company. So we're giving them the tools to to do that. The complexity comes when it when on the other side with the SMBs and the enterprises because there are so many layers in between us and the enterprise or the SMB. Um, that is very difficult to educate them on how best to use these channels. They don't have to use one channel, to your point. They can use several channels, but uh, they use so many channels that from their side, they, they seem to be missing the links between the, uh, the how these different channels are supposed to interact and are supposed to, to come together, which is why after 12 years, you're still not talking about omni-channel, you're talking about multi-channel. Just because um, there are um, a lot of people involved, there are uh, a lot of people involved in the decision making, there are lots of uh, uh, um, partners and uh, technology providers in between. Um, so it's not easy. On our side, what we can do is um, educate and work with the partners that we have to go together to the market and educate them and educate the enterprises. Um, but it remains a very uh, limited and unscalable effort, mainly because you can't educate everyone at the same time. So it just means we can choose. I have to do something with one partner here and we're going to go and we speak to some enterprises in one market, but you can't go everywhere and talk to everyone. So um, the discussion should be really with the brands and how they are approaching the, the, the whole process and what they are looking for in terms of omni-channel or how they are looking to, to improve the customer experience because us as a channel, I can only build what I can build and I build based on the feedback that I'm getting from my users. It's just that um, 
I can't force you, Alitalia, to, to do more than that and stop sending your emails when you already have a phone number. And it's, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So, David, how, how do you, uh, you and Google, how do you see messaging evolving in the next couple of years to really improve and make that customer experience better all around for the customer? Well, uh, I think I, I mentioned some of those points already, you know, which is like uh, clearly we see the possibility of uh, improving the applications or the channel in order just to add different functionalities. So becoming like kind of a super app. So we definitely are seeing uh, two, two different approaches to this. You know? One is definitely improving that from a super app perspective. But on the other side, is something very interesting that I, I hear from other media, particularly with they've been working with, for example, with Netflix. It's like they're seeing this channel as well as the interactive TV in your pocket. Which is very interesting because, I mean, we always thought on this channel like a performance marketing channel where it's going to deliver like uh, conversions and leads and things like that. But with brands like Unilever, we are seeing as well that uh, because the channel is so engaging and interactive and you can add videos and you can add all of the, all other things, there is a lot of value for the brand to keep you in a conversation for a really, really long time. Up to, for example, 19 seconds of attention value, which if you are a marketeer, attention value of over 11 seconds is the standard on TV, so think beyond that. No, so that's what we are seeing clearly. So uh, from that lens, I mean, it's like clearly, if you combine this type of approach and opportunities, and uh, you start thinking about and referring a little bit on the pricing, no, maybe not ready today, but we can convert the channel into a branding uh, marketing channel and in the other front a performance marketing channel. They can start adding more value to the brands in a way that the brands will see. Okay, I want to pay, for example, for the lead, or I want to pay for the conversion. Or want to pay for that attention money. Thank you. And uh, Mauro, strategic partnerships. We actually haven't, I haven't heard that phrase, I think, used so far during the event. But at the end of the day, that's what we need. How do, we, how do you go about building the correct strategic partnerships to ultimately Damn ensure, it. or how should we be going about that in the industry uh -huh. to ensure the customer experience improves at the end of the day? Okay, I think that there are a couple of things. So first of all, uh, our industry is uh, quite uh, different. Let's say we are all a competitor partner and we are in a kind of competition, so cooperation and competition. So each of us in this, uh, in this room uh, has a number of uh, persons that are competing with. And, uh, but at the end, uh, it's all about the value that we deliver to the, to the customer. So it's, uh, before we were discussing about pricing, and the role of MNO. So uh, it is the role of MNO, it is the role of uh, WhatsApp or Google or Viber, because at the end, they are the channel, they, are, they, they provide the technology to, to connect and to communicate. We somehow connect with the enterprise to do it. The question is, uh, we need to be very clear in terms of rule of engagement, in terms of once we, we, we create value for our customer, for the enterprise, how do we share the revenue? How do we share the value across the value chain? Uh, thinking about A2P, which is uh, one specific topic, uh, one of the things that today doesn't work is when you have too many components in the value chain. If you have 25 aggregators that are needed just to deliver one SMS for a number of reasons, I don't want to enter, then uh, all of these uh, start to be broken. And then we start to have conflict or we start to have uh, uh, maybe not right behavior and so on. So from my point of view, in terms of a strategic partnership, we need to, to, to agree on the rule of engagement. We need, by the way, MEF for me play a very important role in terms of defining the standard, defining uh, what, what, we, what do we want to, to do and uh, where do we want to go. We were discussing about, I'm a strong believer of a paper click, paper, uh, conversion or uh, let's say changing uh, the model of the communication. In my opinion, if, if you ask me about uh, how will be the pricing in 20 years from now, it will not be any more by percent delivered or whatever. It will be based on the value that you, that you deliver to the end user. And then it will be much easier to, to, to go back and to say, okay, this value was delivered by the district company and uh, they do it. So, this kind of uh, event are very important. We need to have very open dialogue, but we need to be open uh, to, to discuss with competitor and to accept that we compete and we cooperate uh, in, the same, uh, in the same place. And, and transparency. transparency. I think that's, that's what should be part of the rule of engagement, in my opinion. And there comes the 
you know, the, the reporting capabilities, I right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's something that, that we have to go for. Standardization, though, yeah. agreed format. So exactly. we were talking yesterday about some of the fraud side of things, so it was the actual artificial traffic generation fraud. So someone's sitting there with the money, but actually at the end of the day, we don't, we don't want anyone to profit from those frauds. There has to be some visibility across the exactly. chain between the operator, the messaging company, and the enterprise to actually show with clarity that no one has profited from the bad side of things. Absolutely. But that is the ultimate clarity and the ultimate transparency. Not easy. Not well, easy, but I think that's the way to go for, I mean, if you want to reduce fraud in this industry, right? That's customer experience and customer journey, impactful. So uh, finally, Let's be talking about, again, there was another panel at this event talking about a topic which isn't as trendy as perhaps talking about RBM or Racket and Vibe or WhatsApp or anything, but good old voice. So from your perspective, VIX has been very, very strong in the world of voice for so many years. Where do you see voice sitting within Omnichannel and where's, going, where's voice going in the future without ultimately improving the customer experience? Indeed, good question, uh, James. And just for the audience here, because I know that people are from the messaging side, right? So Bix carries uh, 21 billion minutes a year, uh, which is international voice and roaming uh, voice capabilities, right? Across the across all the technologies, including voice over LTE and others, right? So, so we are a very, uh, you know, um, experienced player. And uh, we believe that voice is an important component, not only for CPaaS, but also for other parts of the industries like unified communications, contact center as an industry, right? So their voice plays a very dominant role still. I mean, there are other channels coming up, but voice is still very dominant and their quality is the king, right? I mean, in case of voice, because it's just real time, you have to make sure that you provide quality to your customers, right? It's, it's, there's no way out, right? You cannot live with a broken voice there, right? I mean, if the packets are delayed and there are jitter there, you cannot hear, then it doesn't work, right? So quality is king. So voice, uh, you can imagine that, you know, we, you cannot have multiple partners. And if you have multiple partners and then the quality deteriorates, it goes over voice over IP, two rounds around the world, and then the call is connected. That doesn't work well, right? So you have to make sure that partnership in that case is really, you know, you know where the voice is going, right? I mean, direct relationship, that's the way to go for. But we see today that voice is kind of evolving further. So there is no decline in this market. It was said 10 years ago that, you know, voice business will decline, right? But I can like say SMS, that yeah. there, is a, there is kind of a resurgence there. So voice is kind of growing in the market, if I may say, in CPaaS, UCAS, and contact center as an industry. But it comes with other features and capabilities also, right? Like you have, you go for natural language processing. You want to make sure that you understand the customer, right? Their behavioral insights, right, over the call. Or if the voice is not sufficient, you go for the video capabilities. So, you know, you see a transition happening there. But I believe that voice is going to stay for long because that's the ultimate channel that you go for, right, when other channels are failed, right, initially. And then that, that helps all of us, right? I mean, if you have, at the end of the day, I, I was in discussions with uh, one of the banks recently and, and the director of IT talked about, you know, you can put artificial intelligence in channels when people want to reach out to you as part of the customer service. And that was a loan department, right? And you can offer or you can first have the chatbot there. But that's not sufficient, right? Because sometimes, you have a use case that somebody has approached the bank for a loan for a funeral of a family member. You don't want to put a chatbot there, right? So you want to make sure that there is voice with a personnel there who is going to talk to the, to the customer. So you have to make sure that such use cases are also, you know, they could be corner cases, you can call them, right? But you have to make sure that those are being taken care of. And voice is a predominant channel that people will continue to use. Fantastic. So thank you very much. I'm going to open up for some quick questions before lunch. Anyone got any questions in the room? Mm -hmm. Got a question from Marie Barrett, back of the room. Any after Marie? I, I think we probably covered it yesterday, but um, part of the customer journey, because I'm interested in that and the customer experience, 
is um, protecting the customer. <laughs> So, um, you know, all the other components like the stability, the quality, the, um, the price um, on, on time, that's all important as well. But this protecting the customer is still post COVID a kind of an open thing. And I think it can destroy the trust of the customer and they go hand in hand. So like um, Diva said, D D Divya, okay. Um, the IOT is really important as well. And you want people to adopt but how can they do that if they're worried about the fraud part and if they're worried about um, the protection? So, yeah. It's the verification, and you, yeah. Dave, David can now obviously yeah, talk I about that. I speak on some of the different measures that we're taking at Google, which, by the way, we're taking this very, very seriously. Uh, obviously, one of the things is the verification of the brands and all that process, which is going to be very important. So you can see the law and you can see that the brand is verified. The communication is end-to-end -end encrypted as well between the business and the consumer. But, I mean, we're taking very serious measures, for example, on spam protection. So applying specific strict rules for how the brands are going to send promotions to the end users. And as well, for example, on how the users are going to be more evident on the way that they can block and report something that they are seeing. No, something originally that was not that evident, but we have made a lot of changes in the platform in order just to make it, for example, happen. We're talking about that topic on a panel at the end of the day, kindly sponsored by John Bruno Aegis Mobile. So we'll be covering okay. that in yep. detail. Um, you mentioned reporting it. That's like tricky. How do they report it? Well, I think that uh, at the end of the day, you have that in the app. Um, that can be but very the app, If the app is the thing that's compromised, that's your, it's a vicious circle. It's a loop then of how, I mean, you don't have to answer it straight away now, but it's something to consider that it's all connected as uh, in IoT. So you can't really report it if you're stuck in the trap of, well, in, in, the, in the case of the way that it operates, it is very evident for the user. And I think that the other protections like the brand verification and the encryption are going to be able just to support you, all the things. I mean, I mean, there are obviously things like artificial in, 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 I mean, generated traffic, for example, and other things that that is not dependent on us. It's more dependent on how the other actors are playing. But in that front, definitely, there are different measures that are in place. Yeah, I would just like to add on the IoT piece here. So between the device and the IoT service, uh, there is a standard coming out uh, from GSMA, which is called IoT Safe. And then the data exchange between them would be safeguarded using that technology, which includes the private and the public token exchange. So that's that's coming up uh, recently. Um, in the last question, yes. remember you can talk over lunch yeah. as well. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, this is Indrapal Mamik. I have a question from for Christina. You uh, mentioned a very interesting approach to uh, begin business messaging that you deployed with uh, uh, offering a service where you can send SMS messages over Viber. When you did that, did you face any kind of uh, 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 technical parity issues between Viber and SMS? I think you mentioned on the price you provided parity, but on the technical side, whether it is the performance, latencies, or some other peculiarities mm -hmm. of SMS that you found and that you solved? We aligned a lot of the parameters with what the SMS was offering, mainly because we were doing this connection and the APIs are available for SMS aggregators. So basically uh, looking at their guidance at the TTLs and um, all the other parameters that we had to include into the APIs, we tried to offer as uh, similar as experience as, uh, as the SMS was offering. So. Um, it was a while back, um, but there was nothing really uh, blocking at that stage. Um, and even down the line, uh, uh, so the technology evolved and the pricing model evolved. So a lot of the flexible pricing that we've been hearing about today, we've been doing it for at least five years now. Um, and it, it, despite the fact that, of course, the SMS aggregators are going to have uh, the liberty to, uh, to add their margin on top, and we know about the profit margins and everything else, um, the fact that we differentiated between uh, premium uh, um, versus transactional versus two-way conversations, um, this was never a, a road blocker, no. So it's, it, it was quite um, seamless in, in that respect. But we were also answering a very specific uh, need. And back to your verification, and this is the part that I didn't understand from our either. Honestly, as a channel, um, it, it's very, it's not easy, but it is, 
absolutely scalable and totally possible for us to verify the businesses and to control the businesses uh, because uh, there is still a manual element in the process. Um, not to mention that when it comes to actually reports, in this case, when you're using a messaging app, any messaging app that might be, the user can actually report businesses uh, and monitoring the block rates and the spam rates, um, we can um, apply measures uh, immediately. So that part, when you're using a messaging channel, um, it's much more easier to monitor than probably a lot of other channels. That's it. Thank you very much. That's it, then, the panel. Thank you.